on the next Great Lakes Now. Fall storms on top of high lake levels are causing flooding and erosion. It's quite a sight to actually see a house go over. Sinkholes at the bottom of Lake Huron. And this is an area here where there are a lot of sinkholes. We've counted about uh, 10 of them that definitely have a, a defined depression in the bottom. And learning how to clean up oil spills and fresh water. The Great Lakes have some of the largest network of pipelines spiderwebbed throughout the entire Great Lakes ecosystem. This program is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, Lori and Tim Wadhams, the Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at Detroit Public Television, the Polk Family Fund, Eve and Jerry Young, the Americana Foundation, the Brookby Foundation, and the Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com slash foundation. And viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ward Detweiler, and behind me, they're setting up for the 62nd annual Detroit Boat Show. In 2019, the Great Lakes saw some of the highest water levels on record. Shoreline flooding has been a problem for months. Michigan's western shore has seen some of the worst effects. In partnership with MLive Media Group, we bring you the latest. Mark Torgrosa is the chief meteorologist for the news site MLive, which has covered the effects of the high water throughout 2019 and into 2020. Some parts of the Great Lakes region have had their wettest water year on record. What's a water year? You know, we think of a calendar year, January 1st. Um, some accountants would do physical year. Uh, a water year starts November 1st, and it ends the next year, October 31st, because a lot of the snow that we get, November, December, doesn't turn into water into the watershed until it melts sometime in March or April. So we use that late fall precipitation and the snow, November and December, to add on to the water the next year. In much of the Great Lakes Basin, the water year ending in 2019 has been among the wettest on record and it all winds up in the lakes. This year, all of the Great Lakes, except Lake Michigan and Huron, set record high water levels, uh, mostly in the summer. Some of the Great Lakes were at record high levels for several months. Many communities on Michigan's western shore have been hit with erosion and flooding. In Leland, on the Leelanau Peninsula, Fishtown is a collection of historic fishing shanties that's both a tourist destination and a working waterfront. Some of the shanties still house commercial fishing operations. The record high water posed an obvious threat to shanties built on pilings. Two of the shanties, including one that um, houses a, the business called the Village Cheese Shanty, it's a beloved sandwich shop. Water was getting into the business. And then our oldest shanty from 1903 called the Moore Shanty, all last year it just had water anywhere from this deep to several feet deep in it. The Fishtown Preservation Society, a nonprofit that owns the shanties, has begun work to protect the most vulnerable structures. We are working in the wintertime to lift those buildings that we lift up out of Fishtown, set you know, back on, on parking lots, and then the foundations will be fixed. The buildings will then be brought back to the exact locations, but they'll be anywhere from 12 to 16 inches higher than they were. In Fishtown and elsewhere, responding to the high water is proving to be expensive. The projects that we're working on, the estimates are at $2.5 million, so there's a lot of fundraising to be done. In Pentwater, persistent flooding caused by the high water forced the closure of Long Bridge Road on May 1st. Tourists and residents had to take a nine-mile detour. Lynn Moore is a reporter with M Live and the Muskegon Chronicle. The village actually implemented its own ferry service using an old naval boat. Um, and that helped in the summer, but they knew that they needed a, lo a longer term solution. And they got pretty creative with a structure they actually uh, referred to as a burrito. On top of the existing road, workers added limestone wrapped in a heavy duty plastic fabric and paved over that with asphalt. And they actually were able to raise that road several feet and it was reopened this fall, but they had to get creative with both of their solutions, the taxi service as well as the burrito road. Fall storms made erosion an even greater concern, 
especially one that arrived on October 16th, packing winds that approached 60 miles an hour in places. The National Weather Service, NOAA, figures that that was the most destructive storm to the sand dunes of western Michigan uh, since about 1986. And they found a spot where they think that about 30 feet of the sand dune collapsed and went into the lake just in about 12 hours. Seeing that kind of erosion and anticipating more, homeowners were left with few appealing options. The things that people are really turning to to protect their properties are the seawalls, um, either steel seawalls or rock revetments, or moving their structures. As the erosion encroaches closer and closer on their homes, they've had to make some real tough decisions, and they're not cheap. People were getting frantic. Um, they've spent tens of thousands of dollars, even hundreds of thousands of dollars, on uh, protections, seawall protections for their properties. Corey Morse is one of MLive's photojournalists. He visited one home just north of Holland, Michigan, several times. The first time, the house's door opened onto a cliff. The second time, things had gotten even worse. The floor had just like fallen out and you know it was just it really was going to go over the edge. I mean it already had started to. There was like a debris field down below not even just like from the house but like trees that like had been like rooted there and all of a sudden like there it's falling over. The next time Morse visited the house had been demolished before erosion could send it tumbling toward the lake. If they hadn't demolished it it was going to absolutely go over that the edge. At least one other lakeshore cottage didn't fare as well. On New Year's Eve 2019, erosion claimed this home near Montague. This was a cottage that's been um, in this family for generations. Um, the woman who actually owns it now um, began um, efforts to save the structure was several months ago. Um, she knew that the beach you know, was being eroded, that the bluff that the home sat on was being eroded. She lives on the other side of the state, so she, she worried about her home, um, but she couldn't, you know, she didn't know how quickly that bluff was eroding um, until um, one evening her neighbor called and said, I'm sorry to tell you your home went off the edge saving the house ultimately it was beyond what she was capable of doing I mean, it's just amazing like to see a house just literally fall over into the lake it's quite quite a sight to see, to actually see a house go over current forecasts don't show lake levels going down anytime soon well we're told by city and state officials that there's no real end in sight with the high water levels, and unfortunately, they can't tell us whether they're gonna recede much at all. Nobody knows what the future holds, and I think that's scary for people as sort of a wait and see sort of proposition. I definitely really feel for them and hope that everybody can hopefully save their houses. I think that there's a lot of uncertainty around here too, like, you know, how high are the water levels going to get? If the water levels did keep rising, I mean, there's going to be a lot more um, houses at risk for sure. You know, we're still in a wet pattern. And until the overall hemispheric weather pattern changes and we go back to something drier than normal, we got to expect the lake levels will continue to go up. It just all depends on how much Mother Nature rains on us. If she continues to do excessive flooding rainfall, we'll see lake levels we haven't seen in modern history. Besides threatening homes, the high water also exposed a shipwreck that's been buried under the sand for decades. Experts still don't know what boat it is. Visit greatlakesnow.org for some possibilities. In 2001, mysterious sinkholes were discovered in northern Lake Huron, and they have attracted researchers from around the world. There are otherworldly environments, and one way groundwater enters the lake, and today we take you there. We're in the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary in Alpena, Michigan. We're about ready to go out onto Lake Huron and retrieve some sensors in some offshore sinkholes. Steve Ruberg is an observing systems researcher with NOAA's Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory. At least 
10 sinkholes have been identified in Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, Lake Erie sit on top of karst geology. What that means is that they're sitting on top of an ancient limestone layer, 400 million years old and older, residual from a, uh, an ancient seabed, shallow seabed. Uh, now, what we're looking at is a system that, as groundwater intrudes into that system, limestone begins to dissolve. That's how caves are formed. That's how these sinkholes were formed over time. Some of the sinkholes are more than 300 feet across and up to 60 feet deep and act as passageways for groundwater, allowing it to seep into the lake. But how much? That's what these researchers are trying to find out. Well, today we're gonna go as much as 15 nautical miles offshore and we're gonna dive down into 350 feet of water. We're going to retrieve some sensors that we deployed last year. So we should, if everything went right, we should have about a year's worth of data. The data collected today could help us understand if water flowing into the lakes through sinkholes is an important factor in determining lake levels. This is an area where there are a lot of sinkholes. We've counted about uh, 10 of them uh, that, are, that definitely have a, a defined depression in the bottom. We have Steve Constant, University of Michigan School of Natural Resources instrumentation expert. Kyle Beadle, University of Michigan Naval Architecture and Marine Engineer graduate. In addition to Captain Travis, both of them will be operating the ROV and sensors as well as the retrieval mechanism. We're headed to uh, our first station, which is called the Isolated Sinkhole. We'll be retrieving two sets of sensors from that station. They'll use a remotely operated vehicle to pick up sensors from the lake bottom. It might sound straightforward, especially on a calm day, but finding these selfie stick sized sensors in an area about the size of a football field in often hazy conditions can be a challenge. I say head down and hopefully we'll stumble on it right away. The sinkhole is about 55 meters by about 35 meters. Even with a camera, you can't always make out what's in front of you underwater. So the ROV also uses sonar to scan what's in front of it. We should see a bright object, and there's a float with air in it. The air is less dense than the water around it, and so that you should get a strong signal off of that. A blip on the screen could indicate they have found one of their instruments on the bottom. So you're just kind of making your way around the edge of it? The groundwater is colder, and denser than lake water. And it contains more sulfate and less oxygen. It doesn't immediately mix with the lake water and you can see where it is, even without instruments. Yeah, you can see the groundwater. Yeah, so you can see the quagga mussels here, and then there are none down here. And so that's the influence of the groundwater. There's a little bit of haziness there uh, from the difference between the density of the groundwater and the, and the fresh water that's surrounding it. One of the most fascinating aspects of the sinkholes is the fact that they are full of life. While quagga mussels, a persistent invasive species in the lower Great Lakes, cannot survive in the low oxygen groundwater in the sinkhole, cyanobacteria, the organisms which first oxygenated the planet, thrive in these conditions. Let's go back down. One by one, the team retrieves the sensors with the ROV, each carrying what they hope will be a year's worth of data, including temperature, flow, and how often the sinkhole turns over or washes out into the ambient lake water. This is a uh, current measuring sensor that uses tilt, so it has an accelerometer in it. So higher flow will tilt it over more and more and more, uh, lower flow less, so the tilt correlates directly with the flow of the water. This is from uh, the sensor that we had deployed in the isolated sinkhole, the one that we just retrieved. So that's a year's worth of data. Okay, we have it sighted. Yeah, there you closed all the way. You ready to come up? Beautiful. So we just hooked on to the float that has a number of temperature strings pulled tight over a five meter distance. You're measuring temperature at multiple levels so you can see how the groundwater is uh, filling and refilling based on the currents that sweep it away sometimes. 
After retrieving instruments from the first sinkhole, the team heads closer to shore to Middle Island Sinkhole. We are at Middle Island Sinkhole, which has sort of the north end of it sheared off by glacial activity. There's sort of a, a bowl-shaped area there down within the sinkhole, and water fills that up and then spills over a ledge out into the wider area of the sinkhole, the wider area being the area that we call uh, the arena. We're gonna, so we'll deploy the sensors right on the wall between the alcove and the arena so we can measure that flow coming out of there. The team will deploy a new set of sensors at the Middle Island sinkhole to begin collecting data on groundwater flow in this location. And then the rays just upstream from them. Yeah, okay, you're gonna drop it right there. Wow, this is too easy. Oh, uh, actually, you know what? <laughs> Can you pick it back up? The data from these instruments could improve the models used to predict how lake levels will rise and fall. The Great Lakes are a large dynamic system, and the water levels are changing continually. They're on their way up now. Uh, the reason that it's important to know that potentially small contribution from groundwater is that even an inch of uh, water level change can make the difference in the way that freighters, uh, freighter companies load their vessels, and that means money to them. So we want to be very accurate in how we develop these models. What's it like to scuba dive into a Great Lakes sinkhole? Visit our website to find out. Oil moves through our region in a network of pipelines, and spills are always possible. But how do you test cleanup methods without spilling oil into the Great Lakes? Researchers are looking into that deep in the forest of Canada at the Experimental Lakes area. The Experimental Lakes area field station is in the middle of the boreal forest. And what we have is 58 lakes that were set aside for scientific research in an area full of many, many lakes. This site was picked because there's no influence of cities and towns and cottages. And it's what makes it important for science, but also a very special place to be able to visit. But these lakes aren't a tourist destination. They're a working laboratory. Sounds a bit crass maybe, but we treat our lakes like test tubes, right? And if you think about an experiment in a lab, uh, you have a test tube, you know exactly what's in that test tube to start with, you add a certain amount of something else, and you observe the change. We do that in our lakes. And now, these experimental lakes are the only place in North America where oil spills are being caused on purpose by IISD researchers like Lauren Timlick. Oil is a very contentious subject. Uh, everybody uses things in their lives that require oil, uh, but there are also very uh, public spills that happen. In 2010, a rupture in Enbridge Energy's Line 6B fouled Michigan's Kalamazoo River, producing the largest inland oil spill in U.S. history. It's probably one of the most well-known spills of diluted bitumen, which is the oil that we've used for the past two years. Diluted bitumen, or dilbit, is a mixture of oil and natural gas condensates. Crude oil is too viscous to move through a pipeline, so the oil industry dilutes it to help it flow. The Kalamazoo River spill revealed a gap in our knowledge of Dilbit and how it behaves in a freshwater spill. There's been a lot of work on oil in marine systems, partly because there's been more spills in oceans, and very little work on freshwater. Beth Wallace grew up near the Kalamazoo River. She's overseen pipeline safety for the National Wildlife Federation since the spill. It is alarming that we have had this particular product the diluted bitumen traveling in pipelines for 40 years and haven't paused to question what happens when a release occurs. In particular, the Great Lakes have some of the largest network of pipelines that are transporting this product spiderwebbed throughout the entire Great Lakes ecosystem. At the Experimental Lakes area, Researchers are working to better understand freshwater oil spills, using the Kalamazoo River spill as a model. IISD head research scientist Vince Pallas is leading the oil study. We connected with him and researcher Lauren Timlick on Skype to hear more about what to consider when cleaning up dilbit in freshwater ecosystems. 
In cleaning up oil, there are a number of differences between fresh water and salt water. The salt content actually is less of an impact than you might think. Really the major impact is the energy. So there's not the tidal influences to weather the oil, to increase its degradation rate, to increase the surface area of it. And so it, it tends to interact with the shoreline much more readily and much more immediately. Just grab the gas. IISD's research team wanted to test a variety of methods to clean up spills on the scale of the Kalamazoo River. To do that, they needed to spill oil into a freshwater lake. A lot of people have asked how I feel about doing this, um, and that is, that is a tough question because obviously you're pouring oil into a lake, but it's so important to know how these things work so that you can react to accidental spills properly. It's very difficult to clean up oil, and that's part of the reason we're doing this project. So uh, doing a whole lake experiment here isn't really feasible because one of the mandates of ISDLA is that we do projects that we can clean up. We can return the lake back to its original state. To test different cleanup methods, the team created several enclosures within Lake 260. In the first year, we had nine enclosures with uh, different amounts of oil in each one, diluted bitumen specifically. The enclosure with the highest level of oil got a dose of Dilbit to simulate the Kalamazoo River spill. After monitoring the enclosures for a year, the research team began gathering data on the effects on the fish. In the lower doses, there weren't a whole lot of effects. The fish were stressed, but it seemed to be mostly just from being in an enclosure. In enclosures that got higher doses, Lauren was unable to catch any fish after the oil was introduced. I can't say that they for sure died because they're in a 10 meter diameter enclosure. So they could just, I could just have missed them. But in the higher uh, values of Dilbit, I didn't get any fish back. So my catch per unit effort was zero. To clean up the Kalamazoo River spill, very invasive methods were used. And they ended up completely ripping out a lot of the wetland and the river system uh, leading up to the Kalamazoo River to try to recover the oil. They had to completely dredge out the entire river throughout its banks and reconstruct it by satellite because it was so contaminated. The IISD's research will investigate whether such methods are themselves damaging to the ecosystem. A lot of the uh, response to an oil spill oftentimes is very aggressive uh, physical means of removing that oil. And you can understand that, right? So from the regulatory perspective, from the public's perspective, um, and from the oil company that has spilled the oil's perspective, they want to get that product out of the water and out of the area as quickly as possible. In some instances, removing that oil using physical means, for example, excavating and dredging, is much more damaging than maybe the oil is. Maybe the oil is, we don't know this. One goal of this research is to see if less invasive techniques might produce better results. We've started looking more at the different cleanup methods we can use uh, when diluted bitumen spills. These enclosures, each one of them has a different treatment in it. And then we either use a shoreline cleaner to clean them up uh, enhanced natural remediation, so that is essentially boosting the microbial community in the enclosure. Or we use these uh, engineered floating wetlands, which do kind of the same thing with the microbes, boosting all of that. And their roots support a microbial community that will help break down oil. You know, we don't have the data to compare which of those three methods is most effective. And you also have to remember that we're monitoring what's dissolved in the water column and not necessarily the oil slick that's on the shoreline. So the, some of the oil may still be there. What we're finding is that le as the season goes on, less of it is available or less of it is solubilized into the water. This research could help inform disaster response plans and remediation strategies in the event of an oil spill from any of the aging pipelines carrying Dilbit through the Great Lakes. I think spills into freshwater happen more frequently than we realize. We only hear about the really big ones that require a multi-agency approach. And so these types of spills happen more frequently than I think the typical public hears. And it doesn't lessen the impacts, unfortunately. In a statement to Great Lakes Now, 
Enbridge said their crews had expertise in freshwater incidents. They further stated, The result of our spill is a company that is even more acutely aware of and deeply focused on safety. Thanks for watching. Finally, I want to congratulate Kalen Sketch and all the winners of the Oakland County Water Resource Commissioner's Office Clean Water Calendar Contest. It was my honor to judge the submissions for more than 700 fourth and fifth graders. For more on the contest, our stories, and the Great Lakes in general, visit greatlakesnow.org. When you get there, you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter to get updates about our work. See you out on the lakes. This program is brought to you by the Fred A. and Barbara M. Erb Family Foundation, Lori and Tim Wadhams, the Richard C. Devereaux Foundation for Energy and Environmental Programs at Detroit Public Television, the Polk Family Fund, Eve and Jerry Young, the Americana Foundation, the Brookby Foundation, and the Consumers Energy Foundation is committed to serving Michigan, from preserving our state's natural resources and sustaining our future, to continuing business growth, academic achievement, and community involvement. Learn more at consumersenergy.com foundation. And viewers like you. Thank you.